All right, so one of the uh, things here about the digital agenda, and the agenda will take this to be a very positive thing, but there are side effects. Uh, and one of them, uh, the one I will be talking about today, is language death. Rather uh, important subject, and I know that most of you uh, in this audience are either uh, linguists or have worked on language technology long enough, and I apologize for sort of restating the obvious, well, what I'm going to say now is very well known from the research uh, on this subject. Uh, what are sort of the defining features of language deaths? The first and most important one is loss of function, that there are uh, entire functional areas, for example, trading and commerce that you now perform in another language. Uh, that's loss of function, that's sort of the first harbinger of, of, of imminent language death. The second one, also rather well understood, is loss of prestige. Somehow the young people think that your language is no longer cool. This is something that old people speak, you don't want to deal with it, you want to move on to the uh, uh, next best thing, which is of course uh, the dominant language in the area. Uh, not necessarily English, but typically English, okay. Uh, and the third thing, also uh, starting with Bloomfield, actually very well documented, is loss of competence, also known as the emergence of semi-speakers, speakers who uh, drastically simplify the grammar, the morphology, even the phonology of their native language, and uh, build a new generation version of it, uh, much simplified compared to the original. Uh, for Gaelic, the process has been very well documented uh, by Dorian for Menominee, by Bloomfield himself, and for Dirbal uh, by Anna Schmidt. Uh, many uh, of you may have seen uh, the original papers here. Okay, so what does this mean in the digital age? Uh, I'm not going to change any of these uh, uh, definitions, I'm just going to apply them to the current situation. So what the first one means is loss of function performed digitally. Okay, so what is the function that is performed digitally? Well, this day and age, almost everything, uh, you know, day-to-day uh, com -day communication is, is done by texting and by email. Uh, uh, commerce is done by e-commerce, uh, official business is conducted uh, through web pages, so almost everything you do is now done increasingly digitally, this is an unstoppable train. I, um, the real question is that uh, can you do it in your own language or, or, or not? So, loss of prestige. Again, this is something very, very clear for, you know, I can see it on my own students. If it's not on the web, it doesn't exist. It doesn't matter that there is this, uh, you know, dusted homes in the library, forget it. Uh, if the web doesn't have it, it doesn't exist. Uh, and finally, uh, loss of competence. Here the question is really, can you raise a digital native in your own language? If you can do it, you're fine. If not, your language has a problem. So, I divided languages into four categories. At the top, we find the comfort zone. Everybody in this audience who has a Mac can go into the language support page. And this is uh, what, you, what you get. It's a list of 16 languages. This is it. If, you know, Cupertino decides to support you, you're sitting pretty. Uh, if not, you still have some ways to go, to go. You need full local support, you need fonts, you need spell checker, you need dictionaries, you need natural language processing tools, you don't have to explain this to this audience, right? And also, all of these things must be free and open source software. Uh, again, uh, if it cannot be torrented, it doesn't exist. Please uh, be aware of this. So, vital languages, uh, the languages that are not moribund. Uh, there are a few very clear statements that can be made about this. First, no Wikipedia, no survival. If your language doesn't have a Wikipedia, you're in trouble. And people know this. People in every walk of life, in every language, they are very aware of this. This is why there are currently 133 uh, language proposals in the incubator. Uh, stage at Wikipedia and many others that are being decided upon and haven't even in, yet made it to the incubator. Uh, how good is a Wikipedia? Here we come to the little bit of the technical work we have done in this uh, area. Uh, we begin by estimating the character entropy of languages. So this is very easy. You can do this by, by doing character counts uh, or you can do it uh, based on the length of parallel text. So we used actually the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because it's available in almost all 
uh, uh, the languages that we deal with, <coughs> we sort of have fallen back on uh, other parallel texts where we had to. And then what you do is filter out pages in from the Wikipedia of that particular language uh, where the longest paragraph is uh, shorter than 450 German characters, okay? We took German uh, uh, to be the etalon uh, of this rather than English because for a variety of reasons that I don't want to go into, we think that the uh, German Wikipedia is more solid, more content and information full than the English Wikipedia. Their policies are different and it shows. So, uh, um, it doesn't matter actually, this is an arbitrary unit of, of, of uh, you know, uh, entropy, so this uh, 400 uh, uh, German characters is as good as any other. This is our threshold. And then, uh, uh, the proportion of the remaining pages gives the so-called real ratio, so-called, uh, because the pages which don't meet this threshold, that they don't have a long paragraph, they tend to be fake. They tend to be very weak pages, you know, they are often listed in Wikipedia as being in some early stage of development and we don't care too much about them. You cannot really get information out of them. Uh, so, uh, so this is the so-called real ratio and then you take all those pages which are real and add up their normalized character counts and this gives you the adjusted Wikipedia size which can differ quite a bit from the sort of superficial Wikipedia size. Uh, and a good example is the Volapik Wikipedia, which is entirely like a Potemkin village. Uh, once you take this filtering, there is nothing left. There is 200 articles left, about 120 of which are about dinosaurs. So uh, there is one passionate dinosaur believer in that uh, uh, group of people. 99.7% of the articles are automatic translations from some kind of uh, geographical gazetteer sort of auto-generated uh, material. This contributes nothing to the survival of a language. This is a, uh, and uh, once you look at it from this perspective, you, you find that currently less than a hundred vital and comfortable languages altogether. So people who have uh, looked into the digital, uh, not into the digital, the classical language death scenario, everybody knows that there are 600, uh, 6,000, 6,500 uh, languages uh, uh, in the world. The exact number is hard to pin down, it's hard to count uh, the dialects and these kind of things. But that's a good number, 6,000 is a decent number. And most people say that uh, 2,500 of those are moribund. So, almost half of them are going to die within the next century. Basically, you have a century-wide time horizon in trying to settle these uh, issues. Uh, and um, Michael Cross, who's, who's done much of the pioneering work in, in, in languages, he's much more pessimistic. He thinks that only 600 languages would survive for a century. And I'll try to be optimistic, and with this optimism, I will say maybe 150 will survive into the digital age. It's an optimistic estimate here. Um, so here is a little bit of a chart explaining on the uh, corner right there, uh, you see the comfort zone. So these are the languages uh, that have it all. Uh, and next, the yellow ones uh, are the vital languages. Okay, these are the ones we think, you know, you can think of a language like Bulgarian. Uh, there is a live community, there are a lot of people, there is no question that the language will be abandoned in the near future. Uh, yet, and there's actually a nice, fine, you know, computational linguistics community, they do good work, so there is no reason to believe that the language is going away, and in fact, every reason to believe that it will successfully make the transition into the comfort zone, but it has not made it yet, okay? Uh, next, uh, uh, you see uh, the green things are what we call heritage languages. So this is like Latin <laughs> and, uh, you know, classical Chinese, Sanskrit. Uh, uh, these are uh, sort of uh, carriers of cultural heritage, very important cultural heritage that we're talking about, uh, uh, but no live communities, so to speak. Uh, and M is moribund, that's not even working at this point, uh, uh, either dead or, or moribund. It's not happening, it's not even happening uh, in a read-only fashion, like a heritage, la heritage language. It's just not there. The blue is not a category in this categorization. The blue is an admission that we don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen in a hundred years, so we, the blue, blue is 
borderline languages uh, of which we are currently, with our current tool, unable to hazard a hundred year uh, uh, time span ga uh, guess as to whether they will be one thing or the other. So the real categories are C, V, H, and M. C, uh, you see 16 languages, a real ratio in the Wikipedia of 0.36, this is very good. Average number of speakers is 145 million, and the Wikipedias are uh, uh, 1.6 billion average uh, characters adjusted. Uh, the vital languages, uh, there is significant digital community which is generating online material. There are 83 languages here. The real ratio is exactly the same. Number of speakers is much smaller, 31 million on average. And the Wikipedia is smaller, about 100 million characters. The borderline. So this may or may not uh, make the transition to the digital age. There are 90 languages here. The real ratio is much lower. It's 0.15 and this number of speakers is lower again, and the Wikipedia on the average has 3.8 million characters. Uh, so they make the transition either as a vital language or as a read-only carrier, which is uh, to maybe become a heritage language. These are sort of the uh, uh, forecastable futures. The heritage language is uh, uh, 22 languages, the real ratio is 0.14, uh, uh, number of speakers is quite low, it's below a million, and the Wikipedia is actually larger than in the borderline cases, so it's a 10 million uh, characters per Wikipedia. And then the moribund or dead languages, uh, where digital natives cannot be raised, 41 languages, these are Wikipedia languages that we are talking here. So everything else, the sort of remaining uh, um, 5,800 languages uh, are dead, okay? So I uh, just want to make this clear. Uh, number of speakers is about the same as for the heritage, and the Wikipedia is about the same size uh, as for, uh, you know, this is very low, uh, less, than a, less, less than a million characters. So uh, the heritage languages are 10 times bigger. Uh, so the borderline languages, a few more words about these. There, if there is no community, there is no survival. That is already axiomatic uh, under the understanding of sort of classical language deaths. Uh, so the Wikipedia language policy could not be more lenient in this regard. Uh, it, at the time, it demanded at least five active users to edit the language regularly. By now, they have decreased this number to three. So. <laughs> Really, there is, if your community is sort of even vestigially there, you can do something about it. Uh, so, there will be people here who remember the Klingon Wikipedia, right? So, there are, if you have a group of enthusiasts, they can do wonders, but they cannot sustain a lively community. Uh, so, this whole process came by as we were uh, uh, sort of uh, building large scale corpora, and we noticed that, uh, that uh, you know, Back in the day when I was school, uh, in school, uh, everybody learned about sort of Bookmole and Inors being the two uh, major language varieties uh, uh, in Norway, and uh, they are having equal official status and having sort of roughly equal size uh, speaker communities. And when Wikipedia started, they had roughly equal Wikipedias. This went on for the longest time. By now, the Inors Wikipedia is a factor of three, factor of four, bigger than the uh, book, uh, the other way. Uh, the Bookmore Wikipedia is bigger, uh, but still, the other one is still respectable and reasonable. And then we started to collect all online material, and it was full of Ninorsk. We, we had no problem collecting a, 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 a gigawatt corpus of Norwegian, of Ninorsk, and, uh, of Bookmore. And, and, and the Ninorsk was nowhere to be seen. It was sort of a factor, uh, three orders of magnitude less Ninorsk than Bookmore. So somehow the speakers decided to take Bookmore with them to the digital age and forget about Ninorsk. And uh, as we say that the communities are voting with their smartphones. Uh, we don't know what to say about this. This is sort of, we don't really want to, you know, I'm not even sure we want to affect this, this, this at the policy level, but it's clear that it's the communities themselves are making the decisions. It couldn't be more democratic than this. Um, so, uh, and I also want to make sure, sure that, that in, the, in the survival game, the passive web presence is no substitute for active use in a broad variety of two-way contexts, so social networks, 
business, commerce, live literature, blogs, these kind of things. If you have a passive thing, like you put out the daily news in your language, that's not good enough as long uh, as the readers don't talk back to you, so that now you have a blog. Uh, and I don't want this uh, talk to come across as sort of as an anti-heritage talk. I want to make sure to say it overtly that heritage preservation has absolutely huge irreplaceable value. And, and I, I, I don't for a moment want this talk to sort of give the impression, oh no, 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 the heritage is not important. This is not true at all and this is not what I'm driving at. Uh, but heritage is different from, uh, from survival. Okay, so here are some goals. For, uh, Franz Josef Ock said not so long ago that for any uh, language pair that Google Translate wants to take on, they like uh, GigaWord uh, monolingual cor uh, corpora and at least a million words of parallel text. And this is not unreasonable. This is not, and, and everybody knows Google Translate is growing uh, by leaps and bounds, and this is not an impossible. Uh, uh, threshold to, uh, uh, to cross. The bar is not too high as far as I'm concerned. All the vital languages can make this and if you look at how Google Translate grew, of course it started out with the comfortable languages for the first, I don't know, uh, eight releases out of 14. Uh, all the languages, still the older languages in there except maybe for Haitian Creole uh, uh, are still in, the, in, in, in what you call the, uh, the vital zone. Haitian Creole, the only one that we think is, 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 is borderline. Okay, so there are some policy implications. I'd like to conclude with these, not so much as a definite, uh, uh, you know, hard and fast recommendation, but as more like something I want to throw out for the panel to discuss and people to uh, have opinions about. So this is not intended as the final word on any of these issues. Uh, first, Different support is needed for different stages. So the comfortable languages can take care of themselves. The vital languages, they need comfort enabled projects. This is something that was uh, um, briefly touched on by, uh, by Thibault, you know, with the, with the multilingual e-commerce pages, these kind of things. You need to do a lot more of that. Uh, the borderline languages, they need either vitalization or digital preservation. Uh, uh, projects. Uh, we have to decide which one. Uh, now the second one is something that people uh, already said that somehow the U uh, <laughs> European Union is, is, is the New York, New York of multilingualism. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, right? <laughs> so um, this is important. Uh, the EU has huge uh, experience uh, in, in diversity and very deep uh, ex expertise in languages outside its borders. Uh, and my policy recommendation is use it or lose it. So think about languages that are outside the geographical boundaries of the European Union. Actually, you know, where do you find the best people to deal with Berber? Which is, Berber is spoken by 15 to 25 million people. It's an important language. It's practically on the political borders of the EU. Um, um, but it's, it's borderline. It's, it's not even vital. Uh, you know, uh, if, if from the digital perspective. It's vital from the classical perspective, but not from the digital perspective. So, uh, where are the experts? The experts are sitting in France, <laughs> typically. Uh, you know, the people who really know something about it, it is, are, are, are in Europe, and uh, very rarely uh, in, in, in their own countries. So, uh, we need to make sure that the basic tools are built for all digitally viable languages, uh, and it's remarkable, again, that free and open source uh, tools exist for many preservation uh, projects, for, like for Ninoris or for Coptic, uh, while lacking for vital languages like Serbian. So, uh, oh, I think once the, the, the meta-share exercise culminates, we will have a much better picture of exactly what's, what's where than, than, than we have now. Uh, we restricted ourselves uh, to mostly uh, tools of our own making, including the Hanspel family of morphological analyzers, stemmers, spell checkers, uh, and other things. Uh, we also looked at weird things like, is there, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, do they maintain a Bible translation for the language and this kind of stuff. Okay, there's a resource page. And the national project, this is the final uh, policy implication I would like to mention. 
is that it's not enough. Again, this, this whole read-only mode and, and piecewise picking mode is not good enough. They need to make their corpora not just searchable, but downloadable. And they, they, well, everybody knows there are copyright concerns. And the way to solve the, this uh, uh, is roaming. You need to randomize it. You need to omit stuff from it. You need to anonymize it. You need to mix it up. If you look at the Hunglish corpus, which was pioneering this, this, uh, this approach, uh, uh, we got all this good advice from the lawyers of the Linguistic Data Consortium who told us that, uh, yes, you can put in copyrighted material. We have in, you know, there's a bunch of uh, sentences there that mention Yossarian. So you know this is coming from Catch-22. Uh, and of course, both the English version and the Hungarian uh, translation of Catch-22 is still in copyright. However, this comes together with about 2,000 other uh, sor uh, sources and is alphabetically sorted with 5% of the sentences omitted. So there is no way anybody could reconstruct either the English or the Hungarian uh, uh, version of Cache 22 from it. We are not, uh, you know, cutting into the business of the publisher. We are sitting pretty uh, via copyright. And this is something that we uh, think that there's a lot of, again, nationally supported uh, uh, projects for Czech, for Polish, and so forth. Uh, Hungarian, and they are not always fully accessible. And the way to make them fully accessible is this, and basically people should do this, and somehow, suddenly, the material that's available for linguistic uh, uh, research will be increased by a factor of two. And on this note, I would like to conclude.